Hello and welcome to the Novel Analyst Podcast. My name is Jed Hearn and each episode I analyze a story to help you become a better writer. This episode is titled The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. Meaningful Endings and the Truth. The Graveyard Book is a fantasy novel by Neil Gaiman who is often regarded as one of the best writers out there. And I gotta say, the first Neil Gaiman book I read, Stardust, which I read last year, I wasn't blown away by it, but I have to say that by reading the Graveyard Book, I can see what people are on about. Neil Gaiman is an amazing writer in this book, and he just has a gift for such amazing prose. Every paragraph, every page really sings in this novel, and I've listened briefly to snippets of the audiobook version of this, which he actually narrates himself, and it sounds phenomenal. So maybe on my second read of this, I'll have to get the audiobook version. But if you're not familiar with the Graveyard Book, the plot is a relatively simple setup. Nobody Owens, his family is murdered as a baby, this all happens on the first page, I'm not really spoiling anything yet, and he manages to escape his would-be killer and flee into a graveyard where he is raised by the ghostly inhabitants as this man tries to find him, but he is protected in the graveyard, and he grows up from being a toddler through being a child, and by the end of the novel, he becomes an adult. So, if I haven't already given it already, spoiler warning, there will be some minor spoilers for this, because in this episode, I'm going to be dissecting the ending of the novel, and obviously that's going to involve some spoilers. So, what I found really great about the ending is this was one of those endings where it was less about explosive action and, you know, like a ballistic climax, which I really love for the record, and a lot of my favorite novels really had that stuff, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's amazing. But this just offered kind of a different taste, a different way that you can structure your endings as a writer. And specifically, it created an ending that felt very meaningful and that was almost getting me tearing up at the end. So... I want to analyze in this episode how you can make a meaningful ending that kind of feels true for readers, and through that truth, how it can make readers have such an emotional reaction to it. So I think a good ending starts for me with contrasting to the beginning. So at the start of the novel, the characters don't really know nobody, Um, you know, he's just like this toddler to them. But then by the end of the novel, he is a 15-year-old about to leave the graveyard and go out into the world as an adult. So you've got a big contrast within uh, nobody's, uh, or Bod's for short's, abilities. At the start, he doesn't really have much abilities other than the ability to kind of waddle all around. And by the end, he's an independent adult who's about to go off into the world and create his own adventures. And it's really useful to think about the story as a loop when you're doing this. So... Classic example here is Harry Potter. First Harry Potter book begins with Harry getting on a train to go to Hogwarts. It ends with Harry coming back from the train and re-entering into the ordinary world. Why is this powerful? Well, if you take a look at Joseph Campbell's monomyth and the hero with a thousand faces, he, in this story, dissects all these different cultural myths from across nations, across times, and he found this kind of pattern where the progression of stories and myths is kind of like a loop. You begin in the ordinary world, you have a call to adventure, you enter the extraordinary world, you go through trials and tribulations and all that fun stuff, and then at the end of the novel, or the end of the story rather, you return back to this ordinary world with newfound knowledge that enables you to live a better life within it. Um, Perhaps you had some aspect of self that you were struggling with at the start of the novel, which is integrated with your personality or solved, by the end of it. And you can link this idea of this circular progression of story and life to the innate truth of the human experience. We rise, we fall. We are created, then we die. Life is a circle. And it's tapping into this truth that infuses the graveyard book with its deep and meaningful ending. So let's look at some specific examples of how Gaiman does this. The first one I want to talk about is when Bod basically is walking through the graveyard, knowing that he's about to having to leave, and all the characters that he's talked to, all the kind of strange and wacky and eccentric and lovable ghosts that he's encountered throughout the novel, start 
kind of saying their goodbyes to him. So, for example, he goes to this one person. Let me just flip through the page in the book. Alonzo Jones, who was a um, traveler who lived from 1837 to 1905. And Alonzo is this ghost that whenever Bod talks to him and he asks him about his life, Alonzo's like, oh, I didn't have anything that interesting. Apart from, did I tell you the time I had to escape from Moscow? Or the time I lost an Alaskan gold mine worth a fortune? Or the cattle stampede? Um, those are quotes from the book, by the way. So he's basically just kind of this lovable, you know, adventurer or was in his life. And he just tells Bod stories and Bod has a really good bond with him. But then when Bod goes down to Alonzo's grave, where Alonzo's ghost is normally hanging about, Alonzo isn't there. Bod tries to poke his head through the, through the uh, gravestone into the coffin underneath, which is a skill he learnt in the beginning of the novel, important note there. Um, the ability to kind of phase through walls. But his head just clunks off the dirt. So what we can see here is a circular progression in his relationship to these characters. You know, he sort of formed these relationships with the different ghosts at the start and throughout the novel. And then now these relationship arcs are closing. They're coming to an end. And likewise, the skills he has developed earlier on in the novel, such as the ability to kind of ghostly walk through walls or the supernatural ability to see in the dark, which he developed and had sort of from the start of the novel. Now he's losing those events. There's Now he's not losing those events, sorry. Now he's losing those abilities. For example, there's another instance later where he walks into the chapel where his guardian lives, and it's dark. He can't see anything. And throughout the novel, he's had basically perfect night vision. So you get this sense that, okay, he's sort of He's, he's leaving childhood, he's becoming an adult, he's throwing away the abilities which marked his adolescence, his childhood, and now he's moving on to a different stage of his life. But perhaps the instance that shows this circular progression of story to the greatest extent is on the second last page of the novel. So at the beginning, Bod's uh, new ghost mum, let's call her, she sung a song that she used to lull him to sleep. Back when he was small, back when he was a one-year-old toddler who had just come into the graveyard and he was, you know, crying or whatever and he needed to be lulled to sleep. So when his mum sang him this song when he was younger, she sang a couple of verses, but then she forgot it. So, if you forgive me, you're going to have to indulge my singing voice here. Apologies in advance. Sleep, my little baby, oh, sleep until you waken. When you wake, you'll see the world, if I'm not mistaken. Kiss a lover, dance a measure, find your name and buried treasure. And that's where, at the beginning of the novel, the song stops. Because Bod's mum had forgotten the rest of the lines. And then here, in a very classic, slightly on the nose if you will, but nonetheless sincere and effective example of closing the story loop, his mum realises what the last three lines of the song were. Face your life, it's pain, it's pleasure, leave no path untaken. Leave no path untaken, repeated Bod. A difficult challenge, but I can try my best. And so with that completion of the song, which was broken at the start and is whole at the end, it's really a metaphor for the hero's progression throughout this, this novel. What makes this such a powerful example, and I'm sure a much more powerful example, when someone like Neil Gaiman is actually reading it and not someone like me who has zero singing voice, is its completion of this thing that was very important to Bod's acceptance into his new parents' lives. It's now being complete, and it's sort of reflecting how he and his experience within his parents' lives is come full circle. It's come to a close. So you're probably wondering at this stage, okay, Jed, so if I want to have an ending that makes you close to tears, all I have to do is set up something that's incomplete at the start and finish at the end? That sounds kind of dry and mathematical and simple. Well, you can probably do it without anything else if you are able to set up, you know, through your plot, some sort of beginning 
and end loop that sort of feels complete. A kind of like the Harry Potter scenario from before where, you know, the character enters the extraordinary world, comes back into the ordinary world at the end. But if you really want to take it to the next level and take it beyond something that is intellectually and structurally appropriate and into something that touches emotions, well, then I think the Graveyard Book offers a really good example of how to do this. Because it's not just this circular ending for a circular ending's sake. It's a circular ending because it's tapping into truth. It's tapping into the truth that infuses the novel and gives it its deepness. You know, there's this great quote um, that I really, really find useful as a writer, and it's from Ignacy Sola Morales, and comes from, I believe, him talking about architecture, how ar good architecture is a window into a deeper reality. You know, it's not an escape from this world, it's actually a way to engage with a deeper reality of emotional experience and universal human, uh, sorry, aspects of, you know, the universal human experiences. And if you look at Neil Gaiman's uh, speech, which is reprinted in the back of this book, I think he sums it up excellently here. So I'm going to read from his speech here. So, quote, It was then and only then that I saw clearly for the first time what I was writing. I had set out to write a book about childhood. It was Bod's childhood, and it was in a graveyard, but still it was a childhood like any other. I was now writing about being a parent and the fundamental, most comical tragedy of parenthood. That if you do your job properly, if you, as a parent, raise your children well, they won't need you anymore. If you did it properly, they go away. And they have lives, and they have families, and they have futures. End quote from Neil Gaiman. So, what we can see here from the author of this novel is that the ending isn't just a merely structurally appropriate, you know, kind of clever narrative device. The circular nature of Bod entering into the graveyard at the beginning and then leaving his new parents at the end actually connects to a deep emotional truth for Neil Gaiman. It connects to the emotional truth of his own experience as a parent. And this highlights what I've come to see over the last year or so as perhaps one of the most important aspects of being a good writer. And to make this, to put this into more context, I want to bring up a quote that Joe Abercrombie, one of my favorite fantasy authors, threw out in an interview a while ago. And he talked about showing some of his early writing to his mum. And he said that his mum gave him the single best bit of advice that he has had as a writer. And that was, you must write truthfully. Whatever you write, it doesn't matter how magical it is or, you know, like how unbelievable it is. As long as there is some kernel of truth in there, some, as some true aspect of the human experience or a true character reaction or a true piece of dialogue or just something in there that feels true, you know, not having a simile that is ridiculous in terms of like no one would ever think that or not having some weird phrase that no one would ever say, you know, having the truth is the most important bit in the writing because it grounds your novel. It doesn't matter how fantastical or magical it is. If there is some aspect of truth in there, if you're taking something that you feel is deeply true to you, such as Neil Gaiman's kind of experience as a parent and, you know, his children growing up, then your novel is going to feel true and readers are going to relate to that. Even if they are, like myself, not a parent, you still feel an in insane amount of empathy for the characters because you're linking to that idea of a deep reality. You're linking to that idea of a deeper collective unconsciousness, if you want to call it that, you know, a deeper you know, aspect of the human experience, which is more or less universal to all readers, or, you know, it feels emotionally resonant, in other words. Because ultimately, good stories, the ones that endure, aren't about flashy action or purple prose. They're about, as one of my other favorite authors, Brandon Sanderson says, quote, people, real people, and the struggles they go through, end quote. Good stories have an undercurrent of truth. It doesn't matter if they're magic, or ghosts, or have spooky graveyards in them. If you're writing truthfully about some part of the human experience, something that is truthful and important to you, your story will resonate, because the truth will always endure.
Thank you for listening to the Novel Analyst Podcast. This episode was a bit more esoteric and less tactical than some of my normal episodes. But if you enjoyed it, I would love if you could leave a quick rating or review on Apple Podcasts or whatever medium you're using to listen to this podcast on. I read every one of those reviews and I really appreciate it. And it helps more people discover the show. So if you have enjoyed my analysis, go ahead and leave a review. And I would really appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Jed Hearn and this has been the Novel Analyst Podcast. Thanks for listening.